Greetings, you ever curious or hurly burlyites. We are chuffed, chuffed, I tell you, to have a party big shot on the pod today. And because party big shots are typically busy people, we're going to get right to it. Marit Stiles, leader of the Ontario NDP, leader of the official opposition in Ontario, is our guest today. Just a short backgrounder here because we'll be diving deeper into Marit's personal story, perhaps on the pod. She's born in Newfoundland, as so many of the best people who don't come from Saskatchewan are. She was first elected in Davenport in 2018, one of my least favorite elections in Canadian history, becoming the riding second NDP MPP. A passionate advocate for public education and a community activist, she was a trustee for the Toronto District School Board for four years. She served as president of the federal NDP from 2016 to 2018. And prior to all that, Marit was the National Director of Public Policy and Research for ACTRA, working to strengthen Canada's arts and cultural sector. So today we're going to find out more about who she is, what makes her tick, and why. We'll talk about NDP policy priorities and how she intends to hold Doug Ford's feet to the fire. And we'll get to all the hot issues of the day, healthcare, education, housing affordability, etc. And maybe, just maybe a little politics uh, before we're done. Marit Stiles, it's such a huge treat to have you here on the Hurley Burley. Thanks for making the time for us today of all days. I actually don't even need to be here today. This interview could do itself. <laughs> it's great to be here. And I am a fan and I'm a fan of the show. So I'm excited to be here. And yeah, I mean, who knows? Like, I, I think in the in the last few minutes since we started recording this, we have a new cabinet in Ontario. Who knew? Who knows how many more ministers are going to resign in the next five minutes? So, yeah, it's changing yeah. every second here. Yeah, it could be stale dated really yeah. quickly, this uh, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's not, I mean, everybody's going to be wanting to know. Let's get right to the point. Do you think Doug Ford's put the green belt issue behind him now? Absolutely not. Uh, I would say, you know, first of all, it took him weeks and weeks. In fact, it really took him months. Ever since he first announced he was going to carve up the green belt here in Ontario, uh, we've been opposing him. Uh, we've had like historic coming together of farmers and, you know, rural, urban, suburban people, environmental advocates, uh, political folks like myself. And, and, and he just never budged. And then in just the last couple of months, we've seen all these reports come out, uh, the integrity commissioner, the auditor general, and he still refused to back down. And so I, I think, you know, in the middle of this like absolute uh, scandal after scandal, he's finally decided to uh, do the quote unquote right thing uh, and apologize. I don't know that Ontarians are going to buy that. Uh, you know, his aw shucks thing. I, I think that the trust is very low in the premier here in the in the province of Ontario right now. I mean, it's uh, and there's a lot of other there's a, a lot of scandals out there, and so I I don't think this is under uh, gone at all. I think it's just scratching the surface. Actually, yeah. Do you take his apology as genuine? You know, he qualified it a lot, and you know, I always say like. When I was in kindergarten, I learned, don't qualify your apologies, right? Just say, I'm sorry. You don't have to go on, but I was meaning to do this and but that. And oh boy, we're still not, we're not going to build the housing we need. Look, nobody buys this. I really don't. I go around the province all the time. I do not hear people buying that this was ever about housing or is about housing. It was about maybe building some more luxury sprawl in this province. So I don't think people are buying it. I mean, you, you know, I'd say also when you lie, when you, lie 10 times and you apologize 10 times at some point people don't believe it anymore and i think that might be where we're at right now right well you know um whether it's uh with <laughs> he's also very anxious to move on and whether it's in a yeah. relationship or in politics the person who's apologizing doesn't really get to decide when we move on do they <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that's that is true. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get to decide that. Uh, the people mm -hmm. of the of Ontario will decide that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a working theory about what actually went on here? I mean, I'm not really buying anything of what yeah. I've heard and read so far. So, person. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm not entirely sure. I do think that there was. I, I will say this. You know, I um. Uh, I, I worked in a government very briefly <laughs> in the mid nineties <laughs> at a very junior level. Uh, so I, I didn't, you know, have that experience so much, but talking to people who have, uh, I mean, you yourself, I'm sure have lots of experience, but, but, you know, talking to folks who were like deputy ministers in governments, I've heard a lot of people say to me, a chief of 
look, a deputy minister, senior staff in a in the bureaucracy aren't going to move forward on plans like this and massive policy changes and be handed envelopes with directions <laughs> to carve up the green belt for a couple of people uh, without them going above the heads of that, you know, newbie chief of staff, right? I mean, they were going to, they would go to the cabinet secretary, they would turn to the premier's office. Uh, so I don't buy it. No. And I think if you read between the lines of the integrity commissioner's 166 page report, uh, there's a lot uh, there that I think speaks to the fact that there, there was, they, they weren't really buying it. Right. And that the chief of staff was certainly not acting alone. Right. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're three years away from an election. Mm -hmm. what, what role might this issue play in an election three years from now? What will the relevance of this still be three years from now? I think, I mean, well, first of all, I, I, like I said, I, I don't think it's over. I think there will be more. I think that's why we're seeing other new resignations today. Uh, the Minister of Labor, Monty McNaughton, resigned. We don't really know why. Apparently, he's going to the private sector, but timing is is very telling. Well, he's an ambitious um, guy. I presume he just didn't w want to get any more of this stuff on. Oh, him. I I completely agree. <laughs> I completely agree. I think he wants to get as far away from this as he can, and he is ambitious, right? So mm. he he I would assume he wants to maybe lead the party, and uh, I I you know this is a party you and I both know. This is a, the Conservatives. The knives will be out uh, as well internally. I'm sure so. Um, but you know, does this does this what does this look like in in two and a half years? I think that um, that really depends on uh, on how much we're able to continue to keep um, the focus on this government's uh, failures. And I think that's really key, right? Because if you look at it less as just like one incident, it's part of a story that we're telling. And the story we're telling is that Ontario is not doing well. And they've had five and a half years now to fix things. And yes, the pandemic happened in the middle of it, but um, people are really struggling. And so when, when Doug Ford says, oh my gosh, I, I woke up the day after the election in June, 2022 and said, there's a housing crisis. <laughs> I mean, you just, you know, honestly, like I, I, I talk to people about this around the province and they say, Laura, where was he? I mean, obviously it's very intensely felt right now, but this was coming. And so, I think, you know, the, the state of healthcare, the state of our schools, uh, all of these things, um, that's what's, that's what's going to weigh on, on Doug Ford and his government's record in 2026. You know, you alluded to this, but there's a number of serious people that say to me that they don't think you're going to be running against Doug Ford in the next election. They think you're yeah. going to be running against somebody else. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, as I said, I, I've seen, we've all seen how the conservatives, uh, the knives come out. So I, I wouldn't take anything for granted. Uh, that's why, you know, even though I absolutely um, am, you know, really unhappy with the premier, and I think most Ontarians are, I think we have to be clear that this is this government's decision. All those cabinet ministers that stood awkwardly behind him from a great distance, I will say. <laughs> In the in the press conference that he had, where he uh, when he did his issued his big apology and his his yep. green belt reversal, I mean they're standing there with him essentially. They're backing him up right now, and uh, and I think they all wear it. And I and I mean who knows what else is going to emerge? I mean, I would also say you know once you get into the muck around deals like this, there's a lot of other deals like this. There's a lot of ministerial zoning orders that have been issued. Uh, there's the Ontario place uh, situation. Uh, so there's going to be a lot more questions around some of those deals uh, as well over the next little while. And I think other ministers and ministries will get pulled into it. All right. Cool. All right. Um, now that we've got the most immediate out of the way, can we just take a step back from the nitty gritty and talk about you for a little bit? Okay, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're not Norwegian, but you play one on TV. <laughs> You know, it's the bane of my existence. Um, you know, I... Yeah, so I I was when I my, my mother was pregnant, they thought I was going to be a boy apparently. And I don't know why, they were convinced. And so they and when, when I was born, I was a girl. Guess what? So they had no name and they went to their best friends who happened to be Norwegian and said, "What's a good Norwegian name?" So this is what I would I bear this. And right. uh, I by the way heard people on one of your other podcasts talk about not saying my name very often uh, as a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I, 
I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting name. It's not now that people are saying it more, I feel like it comes, it comes across better, but, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a, a much, my last name is I've been told, you know, a be- a better name for politics, but. Well, awkward names, you know, my last name, my whole life, if people know how to say it, they spell it wrong. And if they know how to s- spell it, they say it wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're from Newfoundland, so you're one of those many, many people that have um, crossed the causeway, as they say, yes. to Ontario yes. over the years. Um, right. When you did that for education, did you anticipate you would not go back? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I, 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 no, I think when I left, I, I couldn't imagine I would stay away. I, I think, like a lot of Newfoundlanders, it's a big part of who we are. I mean, we're, we literally are, our education system too is kind of geared towards, you know, giving you this really great sense of pride in your community. And, and, and certainly when I was growing up in like the seventies and eighties, I mean, that was a big focus, pride in Newfoundland, Newfoundland culture, Newfoundland history, et cetera. So I, I don't think I ever imagined it, but the truth was that uh, it was a rough time. And a lot of people in my generation and, and it continues uh, had to leave. For, and, and, and once we left, we, we stayed away for work opportunities. I, I don't have that many friends back home uh, anymore. Most of them live in other parts of the country. So, um, and I, that's not that unusual, I think, for, for folks of my generation. Yeah. Yeah. Similar stories from Saskatchewan back in those, right. in that, back in that era. Yeah, for so, sure. Especially for those people trying to pursue liberal politics. Um, <laughs> Well, New Democrats, too, let's not forget. <laughs> no, exactly. In Newfoundland, anyways, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, let's just break the ice here a little bit. Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson is my political hero. Yeah. The last great, ambitious, small-L liberal. The war on poverty, the great society, civil rights. The you know the last big believer in government. Um prior to the Reagan revolution and everything's right. been different since, right? Who's your political hero? Oh, wow. Um, that's tough. I have a few. I mean, Give me a couple. okay. I would say like, I, I really do. And I mean, it's going to be, you're going to be just like, Oh, of course. But, uh, you know, I really looked up to Jack Layton. I still look up to Jack Layton. I, because I think that I saw him, what I like about Jack was that I, from a distance, albeit for the most part, saw him really evolve as a leader. Uh, uh, you know, when he was a sort of scrappy municipal politician in Toronto, that was when I first moved to the city and saw him and saw Olivia and how they did things. And, um, and scrappy is definitely the word I would use. Um, but what they were doing behind the scenes, the, the way they were connecting with people, the building of that movement was really important. And then I, I think I saw him in the, in the course of his leadership of the NDP really evolve that. And I, I really felt that was important. And I also felt like, yeah, like I think he matured as a politician. I think he he learned from people. He listened. Uh, you know, I really admire him a lot um, uh, for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Definitely one yeah. of my heroes. Yeah. Understand that for sure. Did you, were you active in politics before you got to university or is that where you got active in politics? When did you yeah. sort of become politically active? No, no, I wasn't. I, I was so not <laughs> not active in politics. I mean, I think my parents raised me with what I would call like a strong, you know, understanding like social justice. They, they, both of my parents were actually American. They moved to Newfoundland in the mid Draft Dodgers? Uh, not exactly. My dad was a, they was a, he was a conscientious objector. Right. Uh, he hadn't been drafted. He was never actually drafted. I but, for sure would have been a draft dodger, by the way, just <laughs> yeah, in case I, you think that was judgmental. Oh no, right? I know. Um, sure. and, <laughs> and I grow and I grew up with many draft dodgers around me, uh, of course. Um, but I mean, I think like we had a small family farm and we were very close to the earth, you know, kind of back to the earthers, I think. And that strong sense of like coming out of the civil rights movement, a lot of my family were um, involved in that. So I, I had that coming from that place and particularly like what we would now call climate justice, you know. And uh, yeah. so it was in my blood. And then my parents, when I was just after I finished uh, high school, they got a chance to move to Southern Africa to do some work for the Canadian government. And I, um, I really like, I got involved in anti-apartheid work and sort of international solidarity. And that was what I was focused on. And then I, when I went to university 
and I was in at Carlton and this guy walks up to me in the cafeteria and hands me an NDP leaflet. And I said, Hey, I know you, we went to school together in Newfoundland. And I will point out that 30 years later, he is my partner today still, <laughs> but it, he was the head of the, uh, the NDP club. And he's sort of that basically a cute boy was, I guess the reason I got involved originally in the NDP. Youth politics, youth politics. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah, it really yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, and so that's kind of my, that's the silly story. But the truth yeah. is, like, I, I definitely had that, you know, leaning. And uh, and so I was political, but I wasn't, like, big P political, partisan. Yeah. Right. Fresh data. You hurly burlyites know there's nothing I like more than sinking my teeth into compelling new numbers. So, just in time for the fall season and pumpkin spice showing up in places pumpkin spice has no business showing up in, I present to you StatsCan's latest and greatest labor productivity measure. Some context first. For weeks, I've been talking about the hundreds of billions of dollars our presenting sponsor, TELUS, has been investing in wireless and wireline infrastructure and innovation. How it's critical to the continued growth and future success of the Canadian economy. Well, as it usually is in my world, the proof's in the data. Labor productivity is a key measure of economic success because it puts the lens on the amount of goods and services produced per unit of labor input. Decent news, StatsCan reports that over a 10-year period from 2012 to 2022, Canadian labor productivity increased 9.5% across all industries. Much better news, during the same period, labor productivity in the telecommunications industry more than doubled that growth, clocking in at 19.5%. Here's what that means. Canadian telecom companies like TELUS have been a leading driver of economic growth in this country. In fact, they've been propping it up. In TELUS's case, investing in and innovating technology that improves education and healthcare, produces a more efficient, sustainable food supply, and grows business and employment opportunity. So why on earth would we want to stymie all that good stuff? I mentioned it last time. There's the specter of an uncertain regulatory environment out there. Combined with potential policies or regulation, like mandated regimes that put pressures on facility-based carriers like TELUS, dramatically limiting their ability to invest and drive economic growth. So something's got to give. The center, as they say, will not hold. Is it really worth taking that kind of risk with our economy? More next week. Um, okay, so you find yourself you find yourself the leader of the opposition right now. Yes. And... You know, there's always going to be a lot of noise around Ford. There's always going to be a lot of noise around Ford. And it's always difficult to pick a target of what you want to zero in on mm -hmm. and, and really pay attention to. I'm interested. You've had five years to watch this guy from your vantage point in the ledge as premier. Mm -hmm. What's the fundamental critique of his government? Like what... What if you're persuading people to not vote conservative? What do you say? I think they are a um, okay. I'll, I'll throw this one at you. I I think they are a a, a party and a government that is um, restricted by their ideology. I think that their ideology blocks their government from doing the right thing in many circumstances and. I think that unfortunately that has cost us in many respects uh, a lot here in the province. And, you know, they always are, are very quick to accuse us in the NDP of being, you know, driven by ideology, but I see it with them all the time. I mean, I think that choosing to freeze nurses wages or education workers wages um, it, with that bill, bill 124 right. uh, was, was absolutely ideologically driven. And it, and, and the reason I say that is because even when they were given every opportunity to back away from it, they just kept fighting in the courts <laughs> as we were literally bleeding, emerging, uh, you know, nurses, uh, educational assistants. And, and the crisis that we're facing right now in education and healthcare in Ontario is largely a human resource crisis. So, uh, you know, that was something that, that, you know, immediately had that that impact. And I, I have to say, I also think that their privatization of healthcare is similarly driven. It, I, I don't think there's a, a solid argument right now for that saving us money or or actually 
improving the healthcare system. I, I just don't see it at all. And so, uh, again, that's their ideology, preventing right. them from doing what's right for Ontarians. And I think that is what's going to the, 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 be the death of them, to be honest. So that's the core. They're conservatives. They are conservatives. Yeah. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, I mean, I, I don't pretend to try to like, I, I, I'm not a therapist. I can't get inside Doug Ford's mind, but I do think, you know, for all of his talk about being like the little guy or like, you know, understand the little guy, I don't think he gets people at all. I, I think he's somebody who grew up with a lot of privilege and, and I, I, I'm not, I don't want to be like too personal about it, but I think he gave up, he grew up with a lot of privilege in Toronto. <laughs> and uh, I think that like my own experience, you know, both coming from a different place and also um, working in different parts of this province and, and especially in the North, I've had a chance to really, and I just, I think I relate more to how people feel outside of that bubble of that Toronto bubble. <laughs> and, uh, and I love Toronto, but I, I really think that that's something that limits him as well. And he's not obviously like really listening to where people are at because the policies, uh, the drive of this government just doesn't seem to be uh, toward solutions that are going to, that are going to meet the needs of Ontarians right now. Right. Okay. So you win. What do you most want to change? Like what's highest on your priority list? What are you anxious to get in there and, and make a difference in? Oh, well, I mean, obviously like I have a, a, a passion for education. Uh, I came out, I was a, a, I'm not, I don't come out of education. I wasn't a, a teacher or anything. Uh, I was a parent who became a, a school board trustee. Uh, but I think our, our publicly funded education system here in Ontario is hurting very deeply. I think it was before the conservatives. I, mean, I think there were a lot of issues there that need to be addressed. Um, and I want to get back to addressing, you know, how we fund education based on need and not just based on, you know, formulas that maybe just aren't working anymore. I want to get back to talking about some creative solutions to how we, um, how we address some of the capital needs in, in education. So I, I mean, education, I, I, I really feel very passionately about, um, but the situation of healthcare in this province, you know, I, I just got back from a, a trip up to northeastern Ontario uh, as far as Hearst and Capus Casing, as New York Falls and New Lisk or communities like that. And I am, uh, I, I tell you, it's appalling. We are just seeing the beginning of what's about to hit. Uh, there are um, hospitals in this province that are not going to make payroll in a couple months. And so we are we are at risk of seeing more and more, especially smaller hospitals closing down altogether. Uh, it's a real crisis, and it it comes down to this issue I raised with you earlier. Like we have uh, lost many, many, many of our healthcare workers. Uh, nurses is one of the biggest issues right now, and uh, as they felt disrespected, as they realized they just couldn't afford to work like this anymore, and they were they were stressed and feeling the crunch, they they've left, and many of them for reasons I completely understand, have, have gone on to nursing agencies. So now what we have is, um, is hospitals and long-term care as well, just hemorrhaging money out to these private nursing agencies to do exactly the same work that our nurses used to do. And right. it is going to shut the system down. So it's, it's urgent. Now, that's just one thing that moment that we're in, but we are going to have to have real solutions to um, particularly delivering adequate primary care and community care in this province. And it's time for a real rethink. Uh, we, have to, um, we have to address that. I wanna stop the bleed right now, but uh, I absolutely think that's gonna be the priority for any government in the next few years. Now the Ford people, on, on nursing in particular, the Ford people would tell me that they have a policy that says, if you wanna be a nurse, they'll hire you. And in fact, they'll pay for your schooling. Like they'll put you through school, nursing school. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a few examples like that, but nowhere near what we need. Nowhere near. And, you know, I look at I, I just as I'm going around, I'm, I'm trying to look at other solutions, you know, what's working in other places. Uh, the University of New Brunswick has an agreement with a university in India that is is training nurses uh, according to the same curriculum, providing them with the opportunity to come here and be certified right away. That is what we are going to have to do, because the numbers we need are are enormous. 
uh, the, the nurses that have retired, that have left, we need to try to attract some of them back. Absolutely. But uh, we are not going to graduate as certainly the numbers this government is talking about uh, at the rate we need to. And we are certainly not like what is going on with the international credential system? Like I, 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 credentialing like this should have been solved 20 years ago. So, Isn't this uh, the colleges? Don't you have to break the college? Of, I, I, the well, colleges. I, think, I think the colleges are an obstacle. I mean, I do, but but that's just. I mean, they have a conflict that, of that interest. They're excuse. trying to preserve their earning power. Well, and right? it's an excuse, but it's an excuse, right? Because the government could do something about that. Okay. And I think that we are at the place now where the the members of the college, the the actual professionals who are out there, are well past the breaking point. <laughs> they are desperate for solutions. Um, nurses will tell you about the moral distress. That's the term they use, right? The moral distress they feel in the work that they do because they are not, they are, they're handling more than they can, more than they were trained for. Their mentors aren't there anymore. New nurses being put in situations which are really dangerous, right? Th this has got to stop. And, uh, and it is, it is urgent. Now, having said that, I also, I do agree with the premier on the fact that housing is, is like, at an absolute crisis right now. And, and in fact, the irony is if we don't also address the housing issue, we're not going to be able to attract those healthcare professionals or any of the other workers that we need. Uh, because in many communities, there just literally is nowhere to go. There's nowhere to rent. There's nowhere to buy. It ain't there. No. There are not many jobs that make Toronto an attractive place to move to in terms of uh, being able to afford a place, right? Yeah, that is a very... Very good point. Yeah, you kind of got to work in a bank executive yeah, team honestly, or something. Honestly, yeah. um, <clears throat> when you talk about all those things, mm -hmm. one of the things that occurs to me is something that I learned when I was working with Kathleen Wynn, mm. didn't know before, which was that Ontario is one of, if not the, because I've not looked at the latest numbers, but certainly one of, if not the lowest spending per capita jurisdictions in Canada. Ontario right. spends less public funds per person than almost any province in Canada, dramatically less than Alberta with its right-wing conservative government, dramatically less. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the, it isn't in that sense, and, and sorry, and that was the case when Kathleen was the premier. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, after like, t you know, 10 or more years of liberal government. Yeah. So it's not a forward thing. What I think it is, is that the, ta the revenue base of the government's never recovered from the Harris tax cuts. Yeah, uh, yes. Right? Yeah. And there mm -hmm. simply isn't enough revenue in the system. I know that you don't want to be talking about taxes as a new Democrat, but it does feel to me like we need more revenue. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean... I would I would totally agree with you about that we are still suffering the impact of those Harris years. Um, I think we're also the downloading of services onto municipalities is another one of the things that we're still bearing as a province that mm. is, uh, is 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 something that cannot continue unless they're actually given revenue tools, right? And that's part mm. of the problem here. Um, but I would say that this government, certainly in the moment, are sitting on a hell of a lot of money that doesn't go sp get spent. So uh, while I don't disagree with you completely, I think that is part of the problem, right? We have a government that just sits on this money mm. and doesn't want to spend. And I mean, you know, um, there are those who would look back at, you know, in the Harris years, uh, statements that were made by certain ministers about wanting to essentially starve the system, you know, squeeze the education system uh, and create a crisis so that you could... Uh, you could undo it. And I, I think that is, I mean, in part what is happening here. And I, I, uh, I certainly plus played out that way where we have, you know, a healthcare system that is being uh, starved to the point of crisis. And guess what? Oh, here is the, the magic solution. We're going to introduce privatization. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the same thing is what we're headed for in education. If we don't, if we don't make a change soon. Um, but, you know, you really feel it in some sectors. Another sector where I think we really feel that underspending is post-secondary education, where we spend far less on post-secondary education institutions than any other jurisdiction in the country by a long shot. Like, I don't have the figure right in front of me, but it's, it's a lot less. And that's also driven, you know, this dependence uh, of our colleges and universities on on international students. And I mean, you know, that could be great in some ways, like attracting more students, but 
it is also it is, and I don't want to blame international students. It for shouldn't be a crisis. funding model. It should be driven by other motivations. It shouldn't be your funding model, well, right? Exactly. It shouldn't be that we just have to rely on these these students for that. You know, I remember I was talking to a, a college uh, president, CEO that I will will remain unnamed, and he said to me, "You know, he says it's horrifying." As I walk around the campus and I point at buildings and I say, "International students built that, and they built that." And, you know, this is really not where we want to be at as a country, I don't think. Yeah, it's a shrinking of the public sector. I mean, I was I, I didn't know yes. until I moved to Toronto, by the way, that you, that yes. hospitals had to raise as much private <gasps> money as they do to operate. I had no idea. I thought yeah. government funded hospitals. Right. Yeah. But you yeah, walk, drive up and right. down University Avenue and you can see that those things are heavily reliant upon private money. For our they, they absolutely are. I think people don't realize the extent to which, but even in a small town, you go to a small town and you're like, we're so excited. We got a CT scanner now. We had to fundraise for it. And I'm thinking, what? Mm. Did you have to fundraise for that stuff. And and the same thing, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it happens all the time. I just recently found out that, you know, this is a good example too. The government is imposing on on small hospitals, all hospitals to, to get into this, um, uh, some data tracking stuff, which is probably really important. <laughs> Don't want to, under I, I, I'd say essential, in fact, but yeah. uh, they're making hospitals bear the bill of that, which in many cases is going to bankrupt hospitals because small hospitals can't do that. They don't have the money and they're already having to raise the dollars to make, to, to, to build an extension or, or get that x-ray, ma new x-ray machine or whatever it is. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. In any event, access to health care is a growing concern among people in this country with a rocket um, yeah. access to accessing the health care system. You know, between lack of uh, primary care physicians and closed emergency wards, it's, it's a bit of a jungle out there. So this week is Rail Safety Week. It's a big deal for our sponsor, CN. CN's railroaders are out across the country organizing events in the communities along its network, trying to educate people about how to coexist safely with the titanic machines that roll past their neighborhoods every day. So to help out, dear listeners, we've prepared a little quiz. I hope you find it as informative as I did. Here we go. Question. What do you do if your car stalls on railroad tracks at a crossing? Answer. Don't waste time trying to get it going again. Get everyone out fast and put at least 30 meters between yourself and your vehicle to avoid flying debris. Then call the emergency number posted on signage at the crossing or call 911. Question. How many Canadians are seriously injured or killed in railway crossing or trespassing incidents every year? Answer. More than 100. And here's the thing, people. Every single incident is preventable. Railroad tracks aren't places for fun and games, and it's a really bad idea to race a locomotive. Really bad. Question. What is the likelihood that a collision between a train and a motor vehicle will result in loss of life? Answer. A driver who collides with another motor vehicle is more than 40 times more likely to survive than a motorist who collides with a train. Common sense, right? A train is a juggernaut. CN is obsessed with safety and its engineers are highly trained, but they cannot change direction to avoid someone playing chicken. Just don't. Question, where do most collisions with trains occur? Answer, within 40 kilometers of the motorist's home and 60% of collisions happen at crossings with gates, lights, and bells. Let that sink in, folks. Question, how long does it take a train to stop? Answer, about two kilometers. And trains are always moving faster than they appear. Slowness is an illusion. I could go on, but you get the idea. CN is 100% committed to safety. It spends a fortune on technology and training. But nothing can take the place of common sense. Just remember, tracks are for trains and nothing else. Have a safe week. I had breakfast with Olivia Chow this morning. Oh, wow. Lucky you. I, I was lucky. And I managed not to bring up the 2006 election campaign the entire time, which I am enormously <laughs> proud of myself for, for not doing. You showed a lot of self-restraint there. I did. But she was... She was obviously speaking to uh, the Board of Trade about 
the financial situation of the city of Toronto and the problems that the city of Toronto was facing. I've just come from Ottawa mm -hmm. where all the locals tell me, don't go to the market. Now the market used to be the jewel of Ottawa. And now people say, you know, it's really rough down there, right? I wouldn't advise you go down to the market. Um, I had people telling me stories about London, Ontario recently. Our cities are feeling pretty rough. Oh, yes. It feels like some social bills and infrastructure bills are really coming due. Yeah, I agree. What Actually, I, you know, I would say one of the things that has really struck me in the last um, few years, uh, not just since I became the leader, but um, is, you know, if you go to one of these conferences, like the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, right, and you have all these delegations that we just came back from one, 26 delegations from different mm -hmm. municipalities, all kinds, rural, you know, large, small, blah, everything. Uh, what strikes me is that there's two issues that the top two issues are always exactly the same. Uh, pretty much every single delegation of any size. Uh, the first one is the housing crisis, so it's one or two housing crisis, and the second is addiction and mental health, uh, and those two are linked. And uh, in and the other thing I will tell you is that as a leader in the last you know what six months, as I travel around the province, and I've been in about half the ridings in the province now, I'd say if not more, and um, I'll go into one town and they'll say, you know, Marit, I know you, that. And everybody always says that they have a problem, but we have the largest addiction, mental health, uh, homelessness crisis in our town. And then you go to the next town over and they go, you know, I know what they told you, but actually here we've got the worst. Right. And it goes like that over and over again. It is, um, it is a terrible, terrible situation. It's a, it's an, it's an epidemic. Uh, and, uh, we are not treating it that way. And I think what's really, um, makes gets to me is that there are solutions, um, uh, we, community mental health programs, organi organizations uh, are doing incredible work and they are deeply, deeply underfunded, deeply underfunded. Uh, uh, and I think that is uh, one of the places where we need the government to really step up in a big way. What do we do for mentally ill people in this province? What, like, what, what do we do? Like Andrew Buzari told me that we've essentially criminalized mental illness. Yeah. Um, in the sense that, the, you know, the only institution we have for those people is prisons. Yeah, that's um, right. And um, so, I mean, what, what are, what's supposed to happen to somebody that needs help? Well, well, first of all, like, why don't we start treating mental health like a health issue? Like, right. why don't we just start funding it? I, like, it should be, should be covered under OHIP in Ontario, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it is absolutely outrageous. That and many of us, you know, have uh, I, I have two, you know, young adult daughters. Uh, pretty much any parent uh, in this province uh, over the last few years had had to deal with uh, youth uh, mental health issues and struggles. Right, like this is a really big problem. And what are you supposed to do? You're going to sit on a waiting list forever for months when your child or your your teenager is in crisis, or are you going to go to the emergency room? You're going to go to the emergency room. Right. And I can tell you, and but I but nobody there has any experience. skills for you, and and nobody there, and then you're going to be waiting again to get into some program. So if you have the money to pay to get therapy and and you know whatever you need, you're 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 going to do okay. You might be okay. It's still you might be waiting list still, but you're going to be better than some. But anybody else is is really is really in big trouble, and uh, and so I think that is. Um, uh, one of the steps is we actually have to treat mental health like a health issue in this province mm -hmm. and, and fund it accordingly. But I think we also do have to uh, provide the supports necessary in communities. And the other thing is, like, let's start to, you know, to help people where they are. You know, so if you're in the, if you're a kid in school, you know, we, we used to talk about guidance counselors. Guidance counselors are just literally that now. Right. They're guidance counselors. They help you figure out uh, where you're going to go next in school. They support you through that. Um, we don't really have social workers in schools anymore. We don't have psychologists. People are waiting ages to see somebody to get assessed in schools. Our kids deserve better than that. And we need caring adults and we need qualified people to actually be able to provide that support. We need to start there for sure. Uh, that's the bare, bare minimum. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
when I think about those kinds of issues, I, I I'm a big fan of uh, of the idea of basic income, and yeah. government that I was involved with made some tentative steps toward that. Ford canceled those pilot projects as soon as he came in. What is your thinking about basic income? Well, I think it was shameful that he canceled those those pilot projects. I, you know, I, I'm, I've definitely come around a lot uh, to it for sure. I, I think there's what I really wanted to see was the outcome of those pilot projects. You know, I think right. that was a very interesting and exciting project, and I would absolutely want to see us begin there again. Um, uh, it is frustrating. Because like so many things, you feel like you're taking two steps forward, three steps back. Um, uh, but, you know, and I must say, too, like I'm, I'm noticing that that movement of people around the province who really uh, advocate for basic income has grown a lot. Everywhere I go, there are people who want to talk about it. Um, and uh, it's a, just it was a huge, huge lost opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I, I just feel like <clears throat> there's so many jobs now that do not pay a reasonable living. People are counted as employed. I mean, I talked to some guys in the park across the street from my house the other day who deliver food for Uber Eats and those various things. I asked them what they got paid. They get paid nothing. And most people don't tip, right? They're making no money, but they're employed. They have a job, right? I think we're letting people, too many people get too poor in this right, well, society. You know, that is the piece of it, right? Like, and I think you're seeing in, we've had a number of strikes here in the province of Ontario over the last little while, the metro workers, the, the, these are grocery store workers uh, that went on strike not long ago. Um, and actually, interestingly, I mean, that their union is uniform. Uh, they they put the offer, the first offer to the to the membership, membership said, not good enough. We've had it. And, and so they have these big strikes and, and they eventually thankfully are, are now heading back to work. But I, uh, I, I, when I went to the picket lines, I, I like to spend some time if I can and actually talk to people and listen to people. And one of the things that I picked up uh, from talking to many of the grocery store workers in, and by the way, some of them in the grocery store I go to, <laughs> um, we're saying, you know, like uh, we've made workers who work 40 years making $19 an hour, $22 an hour, um, just start with the fact that it's not enough money to buy groceries in the store they work in. Right. Simple. But but also just people who have kind of been, and, and people who, if you ask them, like, do you like your job? Yes, I really like my job. I like to serve people. I feel like I represent the company. I feel like I help people every day. I know my community. And, and something, and they were kind of like, I don't know, satisfied is the right word. I'm not sure they were satisfied. They, they were putting up with it for a long time. And then suddenly they're looking at these big companies with bringing in, you know, massive profits and they're just feeling like they're struggling more than they ever have been. So something had to break. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that's what happened in that strike. And you're seeing it happening across the province in Ontario anyways, that, that people are starting to say, you know what, I'm just not going to put up with that half a point uh, increase this time around. I just can't do it. Um, I'm, I'm struggling. The cost of everything is going through the roof. Um, and, you know, and I want to just go back to because I think the other thing um, that we haven't talked about but relates to basic income is um, the Ontario Disability Support uh, Program because ODSP uh, in this province, it is, it is, you know, it is outrageous how little mm -hmm. people are asked to live on, um, let alone social assistance. It, it, you cannot live on it. Yeah, and, I've done um, polling, by the way. Nobody, of course, that. knows the situation, but when you tell them what the situation is, they are outraged by it. Yeah, and I, I think I think a lot of people are when they know what's happening. And I, I know in the last provincial election there was a little bit of a moment where everybody was kind of going, uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna you know increase it to the you know along lines of cost of living and 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 people on on disability support said, are you kidding me? Like that's nowhere near enough. And we all had to get real. <laughs> we all had to right. get real about it, right? And um, it's uh, it's a terrible situation. I think in MPP offices, I would assume that. It's like, like in my office, uh, our constituency offices, that's the number one issue for sure. People navigating that system, just tr it's a deeply unfair system. It penalizes people uh, for, you know, when they do get some work or when uh, their partner wants to live with them, it's, it's outrageous. Yeah, I don't know how they would afford rent. They're highly likely to be food insecure. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's just, 
it, it, it's a it's a it's a bit of it's a bit of an outrage, mm-hmm. which all of that conversation takes us a little bit into the whole affordability thing, which is actually green belt notwithstanding, the issue that's animating yes. politics right yes. now. Yes, and um, and you know if there's a change of government in Ottawa, it's going to be over that issue. It's going to be over frustration about the economy, sure. um, and and it isn't. It isn't just people at the bottom end of the income scale who are struggling with inflationary pressures. Um, vast swaths of the middle class tell me in polling that they feel their standard of living is sliding, um, that things are getting worse. Um, what would what would you say to people about that? Absolutely, it is uh, the number one thing, and I think, frankly, it is it is our challenge uh, on the left among progressives to have the answers to these things. Because you're right; if we don't, the right defines it and defines the solutions. Um, I, I like to talk about things like rent control. You know, I think that if you're not talking about rent control, you don't really get it. Right. Uh, we have to stop people's rent from going through the roof. I, I appreciate that, of course, some of the small landlords also are struggling, right? So that's a that's a tough one. But we we have to stop rent from from uh, increasing at the rate it is. People have we have to make sure people aren't losing their homes because their rent went through the roof. Uh, we need to, uh, and, we, and so we need to address the affordability and housing crisis, which is very real. It, it's yeah. not an overnight solution, but we could be doing a lot more a lot more quickly. I I still feel like. Every level of government talks about a pretty good game about how important it is. It's all about affordable housing. And yet nothing is happening fast enough. Uh, we need really, truly inclusionary zoning. Uh, we need to uh, get the government back in, in the job of actually building the kind of housing we used to build. You know, we used to build rent geared to income, co-op housing. Um, this is not, I, I have to say, uh, not that I don't think developers play a role, of course, but it isn't going to happen out of the good of their hearts, right? Like we, the government actually has to move and we have to move very quickly. And I mean, what I will say there is that uh, as I go around to communities, I find there are some extremely interesting and innovative ideas. And, you know, if we could build, like, I'll give you an example. In in uh, in Thunder Bay, there's a, a about a 30 unit or so um, uh, rent geared to income housing that was built by Finnish seniors for the Finnish community oh, yeah. back in night in the early nineties. And those they damn have, Scandinavians, they're so Scandinavians. perfect at everything. <laughs> and they're saunas. I mean, anyway, <laughs> they're, they're very modest units, but they're very happy there. And they have a waiting list of about 60. This is just in Thunder Bay. People who want to live. They're not all Finns, by the way. And, uh, or 60 families that want to move in. They are trying to get just some assistance to get moving on building. They have the space. They can they can make it happen. They need to start building another building. They could easily right away. That would be like 30 probably sort of middle income houses that would become available if those seniors living in those houses could move out tomorrow. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I, I always use that example because I think it's important that we understand that when you build that kind of housing, you also maybe, you know, provide other opportunities for other folks like young families looking for housing. And in, in a place like Thunder Bay, that might be actually renting or buying a house, right? Uh, but uh, maybe um, maybe not so much in the city of Toronto for a while. I mean, I think rent control is absolutely crucial for helping people right now in their circumstance. But as Corey tonight regularly says on the Curse of Politics show, yeah. it's not aspirational. The aspiration is a home on a yard with a garage. That's the aspiration. I mean, yeah, no, that's why I use that example, because I do think there is a point at which in life, you know, you say I'm retired, my kids are long. I, I really don't want to deal with a big house or a medium sized house or whatever in a community where I have to shovel all the time for the, the right. snow. And I hear this in northern communities a lot uh, in rural communities. But um, I, I also do think that that is shifting and changing a fair amount. I mean, I think a lot of people are looking for, a lot of people are living in condos and they're quite happy. They want to live near transit. They want to live near, uh, they want to have access to good community services. Uh, they don't want to have to travel and commute a lot. So, I mean, that may be the reality for some people, but I, I don't think it's everybody's aspiration anymore, honestly. And I think, um, I think that's, you know, frankly, that's, that's kind of what the, the, the conservative vision is, but I think they're missing a whole lot of folks who don't see it like that anymore. Okay. Interesting. I mean, I, 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 
I'm, I'm going to call out one thing because I, th- I actually think it's an important discussion to have. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a, a bullshit at the heart of this conversation that nobody ever addresses, which is the affordability crisis in housing has tremendously benefited homeowners. Yes. And there's been a massive wealth transfer occur yeah. that people have baked into their finances. And making homes affordable, again, would be a massive wealth transfer back uh, that people are not looking for. So I'll just be honest with you. Mm -hmm. As a citizen, I want your kids to be able to afford a home to live in. As an individual, I don't want that to be at the expense of the 300% appreciation that my home has undergone, right? I don't want that, to be honest. And I don't think anybody in my circumstance, if they were being honest, wants a true rebalancing of the housing market. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I know I hear you on that. And I, you know, I'm a homeowner. I was lucky enough to buy a place um, in the late 90s, you know, not, not, you know, working in a nonprofit and I could still afford a house in Toronto. I mean, come on, it was a, it's a very, very different time right now. And uh, we were very fortunate to be part of that. And I hear you on it. And, but I also think that, you know, you and I, uh, I don't know about you, but I, I look at it and I'm like, I've got, I've got kids. Um, I mean, I guess you could say I, I want to pass on something to them, but I also don't assume that that will be there because as I get older, I think, um, unless things align well and things really change with our governments, uh, it, it's going to be a lot harder for us as we, we get older. I think that my children, uh, there's, I cannot imagine how they're going to be able to afford a home anywhere in this province. It used to be just Toronto, no, no, anywhere in this province right, right now. And, right. and so I think a lot of people are shifting the way they think. Uh, I, I've really noticed it. I'll tell you that I've really noticed it in the last, you know, two elections a big shift between like say 2018 and 2022 on the doorsteps i really notice a difference in how people address are thinking about these things and i i i really do feel in the same way that i think that you know people have come to understand a lot better most people that climate change is having an impact already that we really do have to change some things um that they that they're coming around to that in a big way now uh, but it is, it is a challenge. There's no question. And I think, um, it's the same uh, anyway, anyway, I think it is a challenge, but I, I, I think it's a challenge that we can overcome and it is why we do need to build these different options in housing. And that does include, um, some of these options I've talked about just to relieve a little bit of the pressure and make sure that people who are, you know, uh, struggling right now, uh, have a safe place to live. Well, I'll just tell you that if houses go back to a normal price, my retirement plan is made. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I feel that. I hear you. (laughs) Well, speaking of housing, so, I mean, the Ford housing plan lies in ruins. It was Greenbelt. Um, and It was uh, not a housing plan, though. Can we be clear about that? (laughs) That was never a housing plan. I understand. The feds have recently announced some initiative, you know, not announced. They've got their housing accelerator fund. They got the GST uh, relief on purpose built rental. But Ontario needs to build many hundreds of thousands of homes very rapidly. Um, How are we going to do that? I think, again, you know, there are solutions out there. Uh, We need a government that actually wants to get it done, and uh, and they need to roll up their sleeves. And, and and the longer that this whole green belt fiasco has uh, wasted really precious time and resources and attention. Uh, there are communities out there that have front plans, municipalities that are ready to go. Um, I, I do think one of the problems right now, and you'll know this is well, what that, is it? What does that I mean? Have plans ready to go. Like what's the holdup? Have like, permits what? approved. Like they're ready to go. There's a lot of approvals out there that, 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 that they haven't, they just won't, the, the, the developers aren't ready to go. They will not start digging. Uh, and that, I think we all can understand why that's happening, but um, we need to start to incentivize that. I, I, you know, one of the things we were pushing for was a bit of a, sun, uh, a sunset clause on some of that. And I heard the new minister talk about that. I, I think that's a good move on their part. We have to get the developers moving on this. Uh, but I, but I do, but, you know, in terms of municipalities, 
you know, I, I visit communities. Like I said, I, okay, just an example. I was in a community in Northeastern Ontario last week. They, they went ahead. They had the go ahead. They had started to build the infrastructure out. And, and then the government changed the way this grant that they were looking for to build these little townhouses, really like 20 townhouses. That would have solved a huge problem for a small community. And government changes everything. And now they just have the infrastructure and nobody can build the, the housing. I mean, this is just stupidity. Uh, we need to we need to have a, a, a partner. We need a real partnership with municipalities. But also, um, the government here in Ontario took away a lot of the tools, the revenue generating tools that municipalities use to build that infrastructure to be able to start doing. You know, and so I think this is again um, a, a government that has really taken um, the wrong approach. We need to support municipalities and partner with them to build the infrastructure. And it's another, you know, as some people I've talked to in the housing world uh, have suggested that, you know, actually getting government back into that job of actually building, building, building is going to be another way to get developers moving again. Right. Well, um, it feels to me like uh, something more big is going to have to happen. Uh, and I don't know what it is, but. It feel, it, it, it's interesting to me that if Sean Fraser and Pierre Polyev agree on anything, it's that the municipalities are kind of the roadblock here, and you know uh, both of them have both of them are uh, Polyev's proposal and Fraser's policy is let's use money to force municipalities to do things they otherwise wouldn't do. Well, you know I, I'm not going to disagree that I, I mean I think using money to incentivize municipalities develop yes that would work a whole lot better than what's happening right now which is you know take away their tools that's not working at all so right. um but i would also say that you know i just again met with like 27 26 different delegations of municipalities from across the province just a few weeks ago and many of them have already got the permits approved it's the developers haven't started so it's not i mean it, that's not the case everywhere and i'm but not jennifer keysmat's one of those more. developers jennifer keysmat's one of those developers who has an approval and hasn't started to build and she says oh. it's interest rates Liz, that's, that's absolutely true it is interest rates mm -hmm. right and that's going to be uh, a decision that's going to have to be made uh that's above my pay grade that one yeah <laughs> ah, okay but i can tell you have a thought about it that's interesting hey i'm presuming on your time can i just talk to you about politics for a few minutes mm -hmm. yeah because you are in politics Apparently, yes. <laughs> Apparently, yes. They tell me I am. So I've got a tiny question for you. It's really small. It's this. Why has the NDP failed to win the last two elections? Head-to-head -head showdowns with Ford and two Ford wins. Is there something about the NDP brand that makes Ontarians nervous about trusting it with government? Uh, well, you know, I mean, we came pretty close in 2018. You'll recall it's probably an issue you and I would disagree with about, but I felt like no, at the very no, end. No, I think I, mean, I think you were ahead. I, I mean, that's we one ahead. of the things that forms this. I thought you were going to win, and then the population recoiled from it a little bit, and it's really made me curious. Well, yeah, but that was, I, I mean, I would say, David, that was in part at least, you know, may have been caused by the fact that um, the, the outgoing government decided to sort of say, okay, the NDP and, and the conservative, same difference, you know, and, and that wasn't very helpful. Uh, but, but I think that that did scare people. I don't, I don't know. I, um, I, I would say in the last, you better election, go back and read latent speeches from 04 and 06 because. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, you know, I will say this to you. I, I will, I will challenge you on one thing. And that is, you know, I, my first job out of university, I actually was working for um, an MPP from Northern Ontario, a, a guy from Timmins named Gilles Bisson. He was yeah, a yeah. mine, still a yeah, worker. Yeah, great member. Uh, just, just, just finally, like this was the last election, he lost his seat, but up until then he'd been an MPP. I'm sure that was because I started out with him. I, I'm, no, I'm just kidding. But I, I had a great opportunity working with him. Um, and um, so I was there for like the last few years, very junior, of course. Um, but I'm, I was really proud of our achievements in government. You know, um, many of the uh, institutions that 
define us in Ontario and that we've held on to were things that came about through the NDP government, like the Environmental Bill of Rights, Cancer Care Ontario, uh, nurse practitioners, midwifery, on and on and on and on, right? And um, so I thought we achieved some great things, but we failed to define ourselves and our own story. We let everybody else define it. And I think that is my very quick summary of my read of what we did wrong. Right. But um, I, you know, the last election in 2022, I did feel like we were running the same election we ran in 2018. That's, again, my kind of, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a sentence, that's my summary of what, what may have gone wrong there. Right. And I don't think you can do that. You know, I intend to, uh, I think that you have to be nimble. I think that you have, I'm not going to define what the, the question is going to be, the ballot question is going to be in 2026 right now. Right. Um, I don't think that's helpful at all. And I, and so I think we have to learn both from our successes and some of our failures. And I think um, heading into, uh, into the next election, um, my job is to, is to build, um, is to come up with not just, not just to hold the government to account, but frankly, not to make the mistake we made between 2011 and 2015 federally either, and just simply take down a government and let somebody else come along. Like we have to be there actually, uh, you know, singularly focused on how we're going to deliver for Ontarians. Um, it's not enough, uh, just to score points on the conservatives every day, even though I, I won't deny I, I like to do that. Uh, it's pucks um, in an empty net. Come on. <laughs> but you have to show people. You have to show people that you can um, do more for them uh, right. every single day. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a huge voter pool overlap between you and the Liberal Party, and yeah. there will be a lot of voters who are trying to decide between those two parties, mm -hmm. which is best to defeat Ford, best on a policy level, best on a electoral level. To defeat Ford, what's your argument against the Liberals? You're talking well, to somebody that's genuinely conflicted. What do you say? Yeah, I, I think that I don't think Liberals know in Ontario. I don't think that I think the Ontario Liberals are doing a lot of soul searching right now. I think that's fair to say, uh, and I'm not sure they know who they are. I don't sure I'm not sure that Ontarians know who they are. Right. I think that, um, and I think that we're. I, I actually believe that we may be in a really interesting moment right now uh, in our world, in our province, in our country, um, where there's an opportunity to make some deeper change, some bolder change than, um, I, you know, I think there's these moments that present themselves. And that's, this is one yeah, of them. That's interesting. And that's so interesting. I actually think that that's one of the reasons why we are connecting with so many people out there. And, and I think we will continue to. Um, you know, I, I am very focused, our, our team here, at Queen's Park is very focused. We have a very experienced uh, uh, bench and uh, we are very focused on building, you know, our vision, a new vision for Ontario. And um, I think, you know, while I think the Ontario Liberals are still figuring out right now who they are, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think a lot of parties go through that, right? But I think in this moment, we are the alternative here. And, um, and you know, you've seen that happen in other in other provinces too, where we've kind of gone to a more of a two part two party kind of system. Maybe that's where we're at. I don't know. I don't know. But I I don't just I don't ever take anything for granted. Uh, but I do think that that's that's kind of where the uh, liberals are here in Ontario right now. Of the five candidates for the liberal leadership, who would you most want to run against? Oh, you can't ask me that. Yeah, I can. I did. Who did you most want to run against? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I, I will be honest with you and say, I don't, I know you're not going to believe me, but I don't think a lot about it. You know, I've met all of them. I think I've met. Yes. I've met them all now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, you know, I, I work uh, with uh, Ted and with um, Ad Adil here quite a lot. Yeah. They're in the, in they're, they're elected. I don't know the rest of them as well. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm happy to take on any of them, David. I think uh, I'm looking forward to it. Actually, I think uh, you know my my focus very much is a hundred percent on the conservative government and how we um, how we take them on, how we challenge them. Yeah. 
Awesome. Listen, I really am going to have to let you go. But thank you. I'm very, very grateful for your time today. And this was a super interesting conversation. It's been Thanks fun. for your commitment to public service. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail, all of you Hurley Burleyites who watched or listened today, and a special thank you to Marit Styles for taking time out of what must have been a crazy day to talk to us. Thanks very much. Wow.